Hi, I'm Sarah Morehouse, one of the librarians at Empire State College. This video will help you understand why it is so important to know what audience and what purpose the creator of an information source had in mind, and why that has an impact on your decision whether to use that information source. You can figure out the intended audience of an information source just by reading, watching, or listening to it. The clues are found in the parts of the subject matter that are discussed, at what level the subject is discussed, and so forth. I won't go into any more detail because this is something you've been doing instinctively since you were a kid. The intended audience of an information source is important because it affects what information it provides and at what level of detail and complexity. The first and easiest way to break down the intended audience of an information source is by age group. An information source intended for children or adolescents won't give you the advanced concepts and dense details about a topic that you need for academic research. Those materials are simplified and embellished to appeal to a younger developmental stage and grade level. There are information sources created for adults of all levels of interest in and knowledge about a topic. An information source intended for general audiences is written for adults who don't know too much about a topic and aren't interested in becoming experts. This is something like an article in Reader's Digest or the health segment on the morning news show. Information sources for general audiences explain more of the basic concepts and skip over the more advanced ones. They often oversimplify. If they're not written very well, they can leave you with a distorted understanding of the topic. At the other end of the spectrum, there are information sources that were created for experts on a topic. The audience is expected to know the basics and the definitions of the vocabulary already. Information is provided at a very high level with details and advanced concepts covered in depth. Information sources intended for audiences that are expert will talk about technical details and research methods. They will give you the data and citations to the sources they used. Then in the middle, there's the whole range of information sources that are intended for adults who are interested in the topic but are not experts. Examples are articles in U.S. News and World Report or National Geographic, non-fiction books that you would commonly find in Barnes & Noble, and some good documentaries. These kinds of information sources provide some details, define the vocabulary, and explain the basic and maybe even intermediate concepts, while trying to appeal to the interest of people who are not making it their life's work to understand the subject matter. Examples are articles in U.S. News and World Report or National Geographic, non-fiction books that you would commonly find in Barnes & Noble and other bookstores, and some good documentaries. These kinds of information sources provide some details, define the vocabulary, and explain the basic and maybe intermediate concepts while trying to appeal to the interest of people who are not making it their life's work to understand the subject matter. Here's an example of something meant for a general audience. It's from a Reader's Digest article about weight loss tips. This tip suggests eating fat-releasing foods, including dark chocolate. The article doesn't provide any biological or medical explanations. This kind of information source is basically something to keep you from getting bored in a waiting room. This article from Discovery News is an example of something that's still meant for a general audience, but it's a much more sophisticated general audience. You can see how it provides a lot more detail. They even talk a little bit about the research methods. They mention that it wasn't a randomized trial because they don't want their audience to get too excited and think that the results are conclusive but it doesn't have enough detail about the research methods or the exact findings because that would go over the audience's head. It doesn't provide data or citations because the audience is not interested in those things. So while this article might be interesting to read, it might make you want to research the topic further, it's not a good information source for academic research. What these high-level general audience information sources are good for is helping you stay informed about a wide variety of topics and maybe helping you make decisions in your everyday life. This last example is from a scholarly article. Scholarly articles are always meant for an audience of experts. The research methods are described in detail, and so is the statistical analysis. There are charts and tables so you can look at the data for yourself, and a references section so you can follow the author's footprints and see how they drew their conclusions. This is the kind of information source that you need for college-level research projects. It depends what you're doing with the information source, whether it needs to be for an audience of experts, or just for a smart general audience. In everyday life, when I need to fix my plumbing, I'm not going to go to the library and take out a manual intended for expert plumbers, because it would be over my head. 
but I'm not going to take out the clueless homeowner's guide to making your tubes not leak either. I need something intended for general audiences, but smart general audiences. I want simple explanations and easy to understand illustrations, but I don't want it to be dumbed down. I'm just replacing my flapper valve, not trying to make groundbreaking discoveries in the field of hydraulic engineering, so it's okay to pick an information source that's meant for a sensible, reasonably well-informed general audience. But when you're writing a research paper, you need access to the raw data. You need to know the research methods. You need to see the citations so you can look up the ones that are relevant to you. You need the level of detail and the advanced concepts. Those kinds of things will only be found in information sources that were created for an expert audience. As you may have noticed, there is a big overlap between this topic of intended audience and the topic of scholarly versus popular information sources. That's because one of the two factors that defines scholarly sources is that they are written by experts for an audience of experts. Expert level knowledge is not the only good knowledge out there, but it is the kind of knowledge that is required for academic research. There are kinds of research that are not academic, and even when you're using non-scholarly information sources, you need to be aware of what audience the author is writing or speaking for. Are they leaving things out and dumbing things down, or do, you tr do they trust you to handle more sophisticated information? Now for the second topic of this video. You can also figure out the intended purpose of an information source from what parts of the subject matter it covers and how it covers them. Of all the different purposes an information source can have, you want ones that are intended strictly to inform or educate. Aside from informing and educating, one of the most common purposes is to entertain. The thing about entertainment is that it can say things that aren't true, but it's not lying. It's just fiction or dramatic effect or poetic license. Some entertainment is purely made up, but other entertainment is twisting and embellishing on reality. An example is reality shows. You may learn a few tidbits by watching the show, but you can't really rely on it not to exaggerate, oversimplify, leave things out, or mix fact with fiction. Satire is defined as ridicule that's directed at the folly or wrongdoing of either individuals or society as a whole. Basically, satire is comedy that criticizes. Popular satirical information sources are Jon Stewart's Daily Show and the fake news website The Onion. Satire may be ra based on reality, but the author is trying to make a point and be funny, so the facts may be distorted or mixed with fiction. Persuasion is a really common purpose for information sources. When an information source is created to persuade, it has an agenda. It may present facts, but it will present them in a way that's calculated to change your mind or alter your behavior. The author may overemphasize things that help their argument and leave out things that weaken their argument. Editorials are a very common persuasive information source that are found in newspapers and programs. They often don't look too different from the straight factual news sources next to them. Propaganda is persuasion taken to the extreme. Its purpose is to stop you from thinking critically so that you'll accept the message. To do this, it ignores or attacks alternate perspectives, and it evokes strong emotions. In these two World War II propaganda posters, the propaganda is trying to arouse hatred, outrage, and fear so that the audience will enthusiastically support the war effort. Other kinds of propaganda try to arouse loyalty, trust, gratitude, and other positive emotions. Propaganda is widely considered unethical because it tries to short-circuit the individual's critical thinking. It is most harmful when it's outright deceptive, when it elicits hatred, or when it evokes support for a corrupt authority. Cults and cult-like religions distribute propaganda to their members, and also use it to try to gain new converts. Ideological organizations like political parties and special interest groups also use propaganda the same way. Governments use propaganda to control the population. Totalitarian states like North Korea are blatant and heavy-handed, while democratic governments have to use more delicate methods of persuasion. Obviously, propaganda is not a good information source for any purpose at all. It's hard to even fact-check propaganda because they use so much doublespeak. Advertising uses many of the same techniques as propaganda, but instead of getting people to support a political regime or a war, it's used to get people to buy goods and services. Advertisements often use stories, humor, and imagery to get you to associate their product with the life you wish you could have. That life could include a beautiful home and a happy baby, 
sexy women admiring your brand new car, or being popular and influential among your peers. Basically, if an information source is trying to sell you something, even subtly, you can't rely on the information in it. Of course the Mr. Clean ad tells you that it's a strong cleanser that will make your bathroom fresh, because the advertis advertisers want you to go out and buy some. It's more dangerous when it's an advertisement for a medication and they tell you that it's effective and has minimal side effects, or an advertisement for a pesticide and they tell you that it's safe to let your children play in the yard after applying it. They want you to buy the product, and they're not afraid to use doublespeak to convince you. There are regulations that try to prevent deceptive advertising, but the advertisers always have ways around them. An information source that is trying to sell you something should not be used for academic research. If you're researching a product or service for yourself, you should fact check all the information in other sources that don't have a vested interest in getting you to give them your money. Sources that are intended strictly to inform and or educate are what you need for research. These include scholarly journals and books, serious popular nonfiction books and magazines, and news sources, minus the editorials. Good textbooks and reference books also fall into this category but sometimes you will find that what's supposed to be an educational resource is actually subtle, or not so subtle, propaganda. Popular nonfiction books also often mix persuasive goals in with information, so you'll need to stay alert to the possibility that you're being manipulated by what you're reading, watching, or listening to. The informational value of news from major newspapers and TV news stations is also a controversial topic, because they're funded by advertisers, and as it turns out, sometimes they also take money from governments and political parties. So many information sources actually have more than one purpose. You'll often come across information sources that are meant to give you information and sell you something. The common example is infomercials. It's right there in the name. Information plus commercial equals infomercial. Here on the screen is another example. It's a short article from Real Simple Magazine about using gray paint in home decorating. It gives advice, but it also guides you to write to certain brands and where you can buy them. Combining information and entertainment is also popular. Sometimes they even call it infotainment. News channels and websites often mix celebrity gossip and human interest stories and in with the real news to the point that it can be hard to tell the difference. Some of the more serious reality shows, like Hoarders Buried Alive, count as infotainment because they do give the v viewer some education on the topic while also appealing to their morbid curiosity and desire for drama. Most documentaries count as infotainment. Some of them, like Tony Robinson's Worst Jobs in History, are more on the side of information, but others are more on the side of entertainment. If you do find information mixed in with a commercial or entertainment, you need to verify it from a strictly informational source before you use it in your research. Then there are the sneaky information sources that pretend to be informative, but are actually something else. For example, this fake documentary, and these examples of fake news. Here's an ad for a fake book that's actually just a bigger ad for the product. As you may guess, there's a lot of overlap between this topic of intended purpose and the topic of scholarly versus popular sources. Scholarly sources are always supposed to be meant to inform or educate in an unbiased way. The peer review process helps to screen out bias. The sections on agenda, neutrality, and objectivity in evaluating sources too will give you more information. There's one last thing I want to mention, and that's the exception to the rule. When you're using an information source as a primary source, it doesn't matter if it has an audience or purpose that's inappropriate for academic research. That's because primary sources, flaws and all, are the objects of our research. You're not doing research with the primary source, you're doing research on it. But your secondary sources, the sources of your facts and understanding, need to be intended for an audience of experts and intended for the purpose of informing and educating that audience. As always, if you have any questions about this topic or any other library or research related topic, go to www.esc.edu ask a librarian where ask a librarian is all one word